Hi everyone and good morning. My name is Pranithi and I'm a new volunteer for Health for the World. Today we'll be having our medical grand rounds webinar on Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we're really, really excited and lucky to have Dr. Pallavi Torka here with us. Uh, Dr. Torka is a board certified medical oncologist from Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in New York. And she specializes in lymphoproliferative cancers such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma. She completed her medical training at Jawaharlal Institute in Pondicherry, and then her residency at the All India Institute in Delhi and Sunny Upstate Medical University before coming to Roswell Cancer Institute for her fellowship, where she was chief hematology and oncology fellow. Her motto is to treat every patient like family and in her, and so with that, just give me Let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Torka, and I'll pass it on to you to give the presentation on Hodgkin's lymphoma. During this, if at any time anyone has questions, you can put it in the chat and we'll answer it at the end. So I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Praniti. Um, happy to be here, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I would love to share my thoughts on Hodgkin lymphoma, and I hope that this is a very interesting and useful hour for everybody who's listening. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into the topic. So the learning objectives for today would be historical perspective uh, on Hodgkin lymphoma, epidemiology, clinical presentation, diagnosis and workup, staging, frontline therapy, second line therapy and beyond in future directions. So my goal is that by the end of the talk, you have a basic overview about Hodgkin lymphoma and are able to um, at least know how to approach a patient and maybe deliver first line treatment. Um, so starting with the historical perspective, um, it is extremely interesting to know a little bit about Hodgkin lymphoma because it's the prototype of many things. It's the prototype of how cancer was beginning to be diagnosed in the 19th century, and then how all the treatments came along, and also now for bench to bedside medicine. So Hodgkin lymphoma, of course, is named after Dr. Thomas Hodgkin, who was a physician at Guy Hospital in London. Um, and this on in the middle is the first um, description of pathologic features of Hodgkin lymphoma that Dr. Hodgkin had published um about like eight cases i want to say and his job was basically to collect um pathological specimens and he noticed these characteristic findings which he described in the paper but the first time the term hodgkin disease was used was um in the paper on the right which 1865 where uh, dr samuel wilkes basically described these findings further and he coined the term hodgkin disease and to note is at that time, they didn't know it's a cancer. So they just used to call it Hodgkin disease for a long time. And there's still this confusion whether it's a, you know, you'll see many people use the term Hodgkin disease, but actually the correct term now is Hodgkin lymphoma. A Hodgkin disease is just a historical term. So looking further at the timeline, the first description was in 1832. And then you might have heard about Pell Epstein fever, which is classical for Hodgkin lymphoma and many other malignancies, where it's like a periodic fever that comes for a few days and then goes away. And that was described by two people, Pell and Epstein. And then um, Reed Sternberg cell, which is the hallmark of Hodgkin lymphoma, was described by two pathologists at the turn of the century in 1898 and 1902. And then I'll show you some further, further advances, but the other big advance was staging. So another term that you'll hear me use is Ann Arbor staging. And that was uh, basically in 1971, a group of people came together at Ann Arbor in Michigan, US, and they came up with these consensus staging. So it's called Ann Arbor staging. Um, now let's have a look at the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. So really the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma mirrors what was happening in the field of cancer in general. And Hodgkin lymphoma was actually the first cancer which was able to be cured with combination of chemotherapy and radiation. So you might have heard Goodman and Gilman, they have this famous pharmacology textbook, which is the bane of many people's existence. So Dr. Goodman and Gilman were actually responsible for using single agent nitrogen mustard to um, uh, against cancer. And they showed that you can actually dissolve tumor masses. 
But even around that time, if you look at this curve on the left, you can see how dismal the outcomes were. Um, patients with Hodgkin lymphoma did not survive for the most part. Um, then another big advance was in 1962, where Dr. Kaplan uh, basically used radiation to treat lymphomas, and he was able to show very good responses. Dr. Fry is another uh, famous figure in cancer, where he was the basically the chief at NCI, National Cancer Institute, and he, along with his team, started studying these rational chemotherapy combinations, and they came up with the first regimen called MOMP, M-O-M-P, and they basically refined it over the next 10 to 20 years, and they, they came up with this regimen called MOP. And now look at this curve on the right. With MOP, they were able to shift the survival from like literally 0% to about 60 to 70%, which was amazing and unprecedented in cancer. Then the next advance came in 1973, which was uh, the Italian group uh, took the lead for that, Dr. Bonadonna, where they came up with this new regimen called ABVD and they pitched it against MOP. And they showed that they kind of do the same thing, but ABVD is safer and more tolerated. So ABVD was found, like it was kind of put together in 1973 and to date, which is like 50 years later, ABVD is still the standard of care for most patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, let's talk a little bit about epidemiology. So in general, you know, what are lymphomas? Lymphomas are cancers of the immune system. And your patient, the first thing they'll ask you, like as soon as they hear the word lymphoma, they're going to Google it and they're going to ask you, do I have Hodgkin or non-Hodgkin? So non-Hodgkin is more common. Um, Hodgkin lymphoma is seen in about 10% cases, uh, the pie chart, which is purple. And most of the patients have uh, what we call classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And there's a small subset who has this specific type of Hodgkin lymphoma called nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which is very different from the usual Hodgkin lymphoma that we see, and I'll describe it later. So Hodgkin lymphoma is not, even though it is taught so much in textbooks and you know everybody knows about it, it's actually a pretty uncommon cancer. It accounts for only 0.6% of all cancers diagnosed. And because the outcomes are good, really only 2.2% of all cancer deaths in the US. Two to three cases are diagnosed per 100,000 uh, population. Slightly more common in males, if you see the curve here on the right, there are two peaks of incidence. So uh, we all think of Hodgkin lymphoma as a disease of adolescents and young adults, so people who are about 20 to 30 years of age, but there is a big peak um, more than 55 years of age, um, you know, which is also there. And that is, um, that is an unmet need where it's a very difficult to treat population in that case. More common in uh, whites. So in terms of risk factors, uh, you know, the one thing that always comes to mind when you talk about Hodgkin lymphoma is EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. It's very interesting that, um, so I'm going to talk more about the subtypes of Hodgkin lymphoma later, but um, there is the nodular sclerosis subtype, which is the most common. And it's more seen in industrialized nations and um, high standard of living. Whereas in the developing world where HIV is more common, infectious diseases are more common, we have the mixed cellularity type and the lymphocyte depleted variant, which is more common. And your patients are going to ask you, oh my God, doctor, I have a cancer. What about my relatives? Do I have to be worried about my kids? So there are some genes which have been implicated, but they're not like breast cancer where we know for sure that there's an association. However, first degree relatives do have a five-fold higher risk of Hodgkin lymphoma. What do we do about it? Nothing really. There's no screening required, but it's just that it's interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about clinical presentation. So let's, I'm going to uh, start with the case study. So, and this is like the most common presentation that you're going to see in your clinic. So 24 year old Caucasian man, no medical, no past medical history, no comorbidities. He presented to his uh, primary medical doctor with one day history of a left neck mass. So basically it might've been there for longer, but he just noticed it after he lifted something heavy and he noticed that he has something on the left side. And then an ultrasound was done and there was a four centimeter supraclavicular mass, most likely a lymph node. So the primary care doctor um, 
uh, ordered a fine needle aspiration cytology, which was non-diagnostic. So talking about clinical features, as in our patient, the most common presentation is asymptomatic lymph node enlargement and most commonly in the neck. Uh, mostly cervical lymph nodes, though mediastinal lymph nodes are also very common. So patient may have chest pain, cough, dyspnea. Um, low infradiaphragmatic involvement is uncommon and it's seen mostly in older adults. Another classic feature of Hodgkin lymphoma is contiguous involvement. So like the disease might start in the cervical lymph nodes and then it's going to go to the axillary, then the mediastinum. So it kind of follows a stepwise fashion. Um, in immunocompetent individuals. And then the other thing which um, is very interesting is that um, people with Hodgkin lymphoma have a lot of times they uh, report pruritus. So actually I had a patient who self-diagnosed himself after he was having itching for a long, long time. He Googled it and his fact nobody would take him seriously, but um, he Googled that this could be lymphoma. And then a few months later, he did come with Hodgkin lymphoma. The other thing that you hear very common that you read always is, but like the patients don't really report it that commonly is when they drink alcohol, the lymph nodes that are swollen hurt. Um, I have heard a few patients say that, but it's not really that common. And then interestingly, Hodgkin lymphoma is one of those cancers that do release cytokines. So you could have patients presenting with paraneoplastic syndromes. So I've had, I've seen a patient who presented with um, Guillain-Barre syndrome that I'm treating right now, and she's doing much better just with treatment. And then um, it is also a disease which is associated with HLH, hemophagocytic lymphangiohistiocytosis. Um, we also talk about these symptoms a lot, and it's seen in about one out of three cases. And what are B symptoms? B symptoms are basically systemic symptoms. Um, classically, there are three symptoms that we need to ask for in any lymphoma. Uh, fever, more than 38 degree Fahrenheit, uh, sorry, centigrade. Drenching night sweats, and by drenching, I mean really drenching. If you ask the patient, oh, do you have night sweats? They'll all say yes. But you have to really ask, okay, how bad are they? Are they every day? Do you have to get up? Do you have to change your clothes or T-shirt or you know sheets? And that's really what is drenching night sweats. And then weight loss, more than 10% in six months. Fatigue is not really a classic B symptom, uh, though many people do like club it into it. So that's about clinical presentation. Let's talk about diagnosis. So how to make the diagnosis? So as in our patient, you know, who had the FNA, what is FNA? You basically have a very small caliber needle, which is inserted, like you can do it in the office. You just take a syringe with a needle and you basically insert the needle in the tumor and you just suck, try to like apply a vacuum through the syringe a couple of times. And then you just inject the whole thing on a slide. So you do see individual cells, but you really cannot see the morphology of the tissue. Um, this technique is absolutely the wrong answer for diagnosis of any lymphoma. So if, if you don't take anything else from this talk, really most of the people who are going to go into primary care are non, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you will become lymphoma experts, but not everybody. So for everybody else, this is the most valuable part of the talk is, do not order FNA for lymphoma because it's useless. So the next type of biopsy is a core biopsy where it is done typically under some sort of guidance by the radiologist. And what they do is that they take a bigger bore needle and they make multiple passes in the tissue and they get samples such as the ones um, at the bottom here. And these are a little bit better for lymphomas, especially if you make a lot of passes, you're going to get tissue. Um, it is okay, but it may miss some lymphomas, and I'm going to show you why. So the best biopsy that we prefer is an excisional or an incisional biopsy, which is a surgical biopsy, where you actually cut out a chunk of tissue. You don't do it for cure. You know, it's, lymphomas are never cured by surgery, but you're doing it to make the correct diagnosis because it allows for more tissue to be evaluated. So it's really important for lymphomas such as Hodgkin lymphoma because what happens in Hodgkin lymphoma is this is the cancer cell, the one in the center with the owl eyes, but everywhere else is just the inflammatory infiltrate. So if you take a small piece of tissue, you might actually miss this cancer cell because it comprises only 0.1 to 10% of your whole tissue. So if you take a small pass, let's say if you take a pass through the 
the pink portion, then you're just totally going to miss the diagnosis. So the more tissue you can get, the better. Never hesitate, you know, and when we, when, you know, there's a saying that we say, when tumor is the rumor, tissue is the issue and cancer is the answer. So there you go. Um, so in our patient, so when the patient came to see us, you know, we did, did an excisional biopsy and it showed classical Hodgkin lymphoma mixed cellularity type. So what next? So let's talk about pathology of Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, usually, you know, like this is a very favorite board question for um, USMLE. So there have been many iterations of classification. So because this disease has been around for 150 years, so you can imagine the pathologists, they love to get together and reclassify, reclassify, reclassify. So finally, WHO, they got together a team of experts and they decided to just take the classification in their own hands. So the latest iteration is WHO 2016, where Hodgkin lymphoma is classified into two varieties, classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Classical Hodgkin lymphoma is truly what we consider Hodgkin lymphoma when we read about it. And it has four subtypes, nodular sclerosis, which is the most common, lymphocyte rich, uh, mixed cellularity, and lymphocyte depleted. Lymphocyte depleted is almost exclusively seen in patients with HIV. And it's always associated with EBV infection. Um, so now let's talk about the Reed-Sternberg cell, which is now actually called the HRS cell, the Hodgkin Reed-Sternberg cell. So these are basically large cells. Let me show you a figure. So look at this in the center where it really looks like owl's eye. So these are large cells with um, two nuclei, which are called owl's eyes. And there are a lot of variants. So you, it could be a mononucleate cell, like on the left side, and then it could be a lacunar cell, like on the right side, where there's a lot of scanned cytoplasm. Um, it could be multinucleated. It could be what we call a popcorn cell. And then it could also be mummified, like a pycnotic cell, which you can see below on the right side, um, just depending on uh, different, um, different pathologies. So sometimes it's hard. You know, in the old times, we just had morphology to make this diagnosis, and the pathologist really had to be very astute, and they used to miss it. So now we have something called immunohistochemistry, where you have antibodies where you can test what proteins are expressed on these cancer cells. So there is a classic, what we call immunophenotype of these Reed-Sternberg cells, which makes the diagnosis easy. So classic, classically, Reed-Sternberg cells have CD15, CD30, and CD25, and they're negative for all the markers mentioned here. So that, that is what kind of uh, gives you a diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma. And you have to see a Reed-Sternberg cell to make a diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, let's talk about pathogenesis. So remember I said that the, the HRS cell, the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell has CD30. CD30 is basically a protein that is, in, that is very important for survival of Reed Sternberg cells. So you have to have CD30 to diagnose something as a Reed Sternberg cell. And so there is a, so the tumor microenvironment is very important in Hodgkin lymphoma, where there is a cross signaling between the, the Reed Sternberg cell and all the cells which are surrounding it, like eosinophils, mast cells, and macrophages, which bind to the CD30, and then they kind of propagate each other. And the other very important thing to remember is that, you know, you might wonder, wow, there are so many immune cells around this Reed Sternberg cell. Why aren't they killing the cell? You know, and that's because the, the Reed Sternberg cell, it's really, really smart. It kind of makes a smoke screen around it called PDL1. It, it expresses this PDL1, which kind of paralyzes all the other immune cells around it and, and just like cools them down so that they are all surrounding it, but they really can't attack the uh, Reed Sternberg cell. And this is going to be really important when we talk about treatment, both the CD30 and the PDL1. Um, so now you, you know that you have this patient, you know that they have Hodgkin lymphoma, you know the exact pathology. Now, of course, you have to do something about it, right? So making a treatment plan. So first thing, you, you reached where the first, you, we answered the first question. Do I know what this is? Great. Now we have to answer the rest of the questions is, do I know where it is? And then we have to decide, can I cure this diagnosis? Can I cure this diagnosis in this patient? 
And if I can, what are my chances? You know, there's no 0% or 100%. So where do we fall? So let's talk about that. So of course we have to answer, do I know where it is? So let's talk about staging. So in terms of baseline investigations, it's a lymphoma, it's a cancer of the immune system. So we of course need a complete blood count. It's going to tell us um, whether there, it is possible that it's in the bone marrow, you know, what's the patient's nutritional status and such. We're going to do a comprehensive metabolic panel to look at their kidney and liver function, make sure they might they they are fit enough to tolerate chemotherapy, or whether we have to make any dose adjustments. Typically, we like to do a lactate dehydrogenase just to understand how aggressive this cancer is. You know, if you have a higher LDH, means something is growing really fast. Um, we do an ESR, erythrocyte, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, because that's um, that's a variable that. Is in, um, that is used in the prognostic models. Um, HIV has a close association with Hodgkin, so any new patient with Hodgkin lymphoma should definitely be tested for HIV. And the most important, most valuable test is a PET-CT scan for staging, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We used to do bone marrows quite a lot, but many recent studies have shown that, you know, your PET CT can kind of tell you whether the bone marrow is lighting up or not. So in most cases, we, um, we've kind of um, gone away from doing uh, more bone marrow biopsies. And again, if you read historical textbooks before they had PET CT and CT scans, they actually used to perform diagnostic laparoscopy with splenectomy to establish the stage, but that's only of historical interest right now. So, so remember I mentioned that Ann Arbor staging, which was I think in 1973, they kind of um, came together and finalized it. And there've been a lot of iterations. So the latest iteration is something called Lugano staging, but it's essentially the same. So there are four stages of lymphoma, and this applies to actually any lymphoma. There are four stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. So stage one is basically that it's only in one spot. Stage two is that it's in two spots, but it's all either above the diaphragm or all below the diaphragm. So only one. Stage three is it's still only in the lymphatic organs, but it's on both sides of the diaphragm. And to note here is that spleen is actually considered a lymphatic organ. And stage four is when it's, an ex when it's in an extra lymphatic organ, um, like the liver or the bone marrow or the bone, um, so that's stage four. And then, you know, you can add A or B depending on whether the patient has um, B symptoms or not. So this is the PET scan for our patient. So, you know, basically a PET scan is a PET CT. So what we do is we do a CT scan, which is not, which is a low dose CT scan essentially. And then there's also this contrast called fluorodeoxyglucose, which is radio labeled. Uh, glucose essentially. So you inject that into the patient and wherever there are cells which are rapidly dividing, they take up more sugar. So that area lights up. So these were the two lymph nodes that kind of lit up, two areas that lit up and then they compared with the CT scan that was taken simultaneously to see what, what organ this is. So you can see this, this thing that lit up is basically this axillary lymph node here. And this thing that lit up is basically this tiny lymph node right in front of the clavicle. So the patient, he had no other symptoms. Um, so he had no B symptoms. So he was adjudicated as a stage 2A disease. So great. So you now you know this patient has classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Now you know the patient has stage 2A disease. So now we have to make a treatment plan. So let's now segue into talking about the treatment. So few things that we have to remember about Hodgkin lymphoma. First, let's look at the five-year survival rate for Hodgkin lymphoma. And even this data is not current. This data is almost eight years old now. But the five-year survival for Hodgkin lymphoma is over 80, it's about 85%. In fact, in many patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, the cure rates, cure, I'm talking about cure rates, not just control or remission or whatever, the cure rates are approaching 90%. So it is a highly curable malignancy that happens in young individuals. So we have to really find that balance between cure and short and long-term toxicities. We, because these people, if I'm diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma at the age of 20, I'm going to live another 70, 80 years. And I don't want to be 
dealing with the side effects of treatment that I had when I was a kid throughout my life. And so it's very important to do pre-treatment workup first to ensure that the patient is fit enough for whatever treatment you're going to recommend. So pre-treatment workup includes echocardiogram because one of the, remember ABVD, so in ABVD, the first drug is adriamycin, which can affect the heart in uh, rare cases. Then we have to do pulmonary function tests, including DLCO, a diffusion lung capacity, uh, which is um, important because in ABVD, the B is, stands for bleomycin, which can cause lung toxicity. And the one thing that we very commonly forget is fertility preservation. Even though ABVD is not really a, a, a chemo cocktail which causes a lot of infertility, it's always a possibility. So we have to, if there is time, we always have to offer patients fertility preservation like sperm banking or oocyte preservation before they're able to start treatment. Um, Again, back to ABVD. So this was, remember Dr. Bonadonna from the Italian group who kind of pioneered ABVD. So this was his original paper in cancer in 1975 that described ABVD and compared it with MOP. And this is the landmark data that we still base our treatment on to this day, 50 years later. So as mentioned, ABVD, adriamycin and doxorubicin are the same thing. Bleomycin, V stands for vinblastin, and D stands for dacarbazine. And how they came up with this is because they have non-overlapping toxicities and they kind of attack the cancer in different ways. So, so now we know that we're going to use ABVD, but then how many cycles and, you know, like, do we need radiation with it? All that is defined by something called risk scoring. So, in Hodgkin lymphoma, the first thing to decide is whether it's early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, which means is it all above the diaphragm, stage one or two, or is it advanced stage, which is stage three or four. So for example, in our patient, he has stage 2A disease. So it's early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. So we are going to be using this risk scoring. And you know, GHSG is German Hodgkin study group, which is for some reason, um, Hodgkin lymphoma is super common in Germany. So they have done these massive studies with 2,000, 2,000 patients. And a lot of what we do now is, is data that kind of came from those studies. So that's GHSG. EORTC is European uh, Research Group. Sorry, I forget the, what it stands for. But uh, that's another big group. And NCCN is our American group, which is National Clinical, a Comprehensive Clinical Network uh, or Cancer Network. So they all have come up with these different like risk factors. And if you have even one of those risk factors, you're called unfavorable. You have unfavorable disease. I don't want to like stress on each risk factor, but bottom line is it's, they're basically similar. And what they're telling you is that even though it's early stage, there's just too much disease. So that is the risk factor used in early stage Hodgkin. But, and then like, if you look at these risk scores, if you have unfavorable risk, there is, you know, like, so the green, the blue lines are for favorable and the uh, orange lines are for unfavorable. So there is a difference, but I mean, look at it. Like the big picture is that even if you have unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, you're going to do excellent. You're, we're talking about survivals of 96% versus 99% five years, you know? Um, in the advanced stage, in contrast, we have some other risk factors, which is called the IPS score, International Prognostic Score. And remember I said you have to do a CBC and CMP. You've got to do that because um, you, know, you need albumin for that. You need hemoglobin for that. You need to know the stage, if you're older, or if, you're, if you have a higher white cell count. Again, all basically markers that you have a high burden of disease. And if you look at that, you know, they divided it. And again, that is very nicely predictive of outcomes where if you have a low IPS score, you're doing, going to do good. And if you have a bad IPS score, you're going to do worse. So the next step after I have the stage of a patient is I calculate these scoring systems to see what kind of risk do they have? Do I need to give them less treatment or do I need to give more treatment? So, so to summarize, basically, after you know the stage, you divide the patient into risk groups. So if you have a patient who has early favorable disease, your cure rate is 90%. So your therapeutic priority is to reduce toxicity. 
if you have early unfavorable, your cure rate is 80 to 85%. It's okay, but we want to do better. So therapeutic priority is to increase the efficacy. And the same thing is for advanced stage where the cure rate is 75%. So much better than many other cancers, but we would love to for it to go higher even. Um, and why do I keep harping about toxicities? Because I want to point your attention to this um, graph here on the left. Look at this. So as so, let's say you have a 20-year-old who you treated for your Hodgkin lymphoma early stage, like our patient. Over the next 30 years, he's, he's cured. He's not going to get Hodgkin lymphoma again. But look at his risk of developing secondary cancers. Look at his risk for cardiovascular events. That keeps going up exponentially, and this patient will likely die from the side effects of your treatment. Okay, now let's look at this curve, this graph on the right side. So this is a patient who is treated with Hodgkin. This is a woman who was treated for Hodgkin lymphoma. And look at the risk of breast cancer skyrocketing as the years go by. And the younger you are when you're diagnosed, the more risk of you getting a breast cancer um, in the future. Same thing here. Look at the risk of secondary malignancies as you would as as the age goes by, and the, the risk of heart failure. So these are very real risks in younger individuals. So we have to be really mindful of what we are doing in terms of treatment. So what so what can we do? What have we done to kind of you know sure ABVD, but can we do anything? So one of the biggest advances that have happened is the evolution of radiation therapy. So. This was how radiation started way back when, which was called total nodal irradiation. They basically irradiated every single lymph node group in the organ, in the body. Then they went to something called subtotal nodal irradiation, and it's also called mantle radiation because it kind of looks like the like somebody is wearing a mantle. Um, then they kind of refined it further and did, did IFRT, involved field RT, which let's say our patient who had left cervical adenopathy, they kind of get the whole field of cervical lymph nodes on the left side radiated. Um, but the latest is what we call involved node RT or involved site RT, which is basically you personalize it to the patient. So you look at their PET scan before they started treatment and you basically radiate only a very small area around that. And why these advances have happened is because we have better technology. The machines that develop that deliver radiation are so much more sophisticated. It's all computer programming rather than manual programming. And also because we don't use radiation alone uh, in lymphomas, we combine it with chemotherapy. So the heavy lift is being done by, it's being split basically, it's chemo radiation. So you really don't need to overdo the radiation. So this advance has been probably the single most reason why the risk of breast cancer has gone down because now the patients are not having their breasts irradiated, risk of lung cancer has gone down, risk of um, hypothyroidism from neck irradiation has gone down, um, and MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, because when you do so much radiation, your marrow gets affected. So that was a big advance. So what else are we doing to find the sweet spot, basically? So, so basic, so let's talk about early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, like our patient. So great. So now we know that we can combine chemo and radiation and we can, we need to kind of do less and less. So this was again, that German uh, group study where they did this four by four factorial approach where they, they were studying two questions. Do we need to do two cycles of ABVD or four cycles of ABVD? And do we, know, do we do 20 gray of radiation or 30 gray of radiation? So what they basically found is that less is more. So if you do two cycles of ABVD and 20 gray of radiation, your outcomes are the same. So that is the standard of care right now is 20, um, 20 gray um, of radiation and two cycles of ABVD. Now, this was another trial, and I just want to point it out is because, well, what if you're what if you're a woman? What if your patient is a woman and she has axillary Hodgkin lymphoma? You really don't want to use any radiation. So then there's another group which did this rapid trial where they did only chemotherapy-based approach. So basically what they did was they did, they used something called a PET-adapted approach where you do ABVD, 
you do a pet if the pet is negative you basically stop and what happened is that they found that if you look at this curve on the right if you did radiation versus no radiation it was all the same so um and this so so that was awesome so you could do two cycles of abvd and radiation or you could just do three to four cycles of abvd and be done with it what was the other very very interesting thing that came out of this rapid study was the the value of an interim pet scan and this is probably one of the most important themes in hodgkin lymphoma is adapted therapy so you don't just think of a plan on day 1 and then stick with it you basically monitor the plan based on what's happening on the field like a football game and then you you kind of like make adjustments so what they found is that no matter what arm you were in if you had a pet scan with a dual of 5 basically you had a positive pet scan during treatment you did worse and this has been harnessed in other um, in the like in other things that i talk about so in any case to summarize if you have a patient with early stage favorable disease you can either do combined modality treatment or just chemotherapy based treatment and the same kind of principle applies for early stage unfavorable disease so in our patient who had early stage favorable disease um he uh, we offered him sperm banking which he did and then he was treated with two cycles of abvd his pet showed remission that's awesome so he finished off with some radiation and he was in remission and he's been in remission for the past 3 years and he's doing great with no side effects of treatment um so so that was all good let's talk about another case and um this this case is a little bit different so this is a 26 year old man who first noticed a left cervical mass in 2018 and he was having some wrenching night sweats but he just ignored it because he was feeling good otherwise the mass was kind of stable for 3 years but then it started growing but he still didn't do anything but then finally he got really really sick with high grade fever severe pain he just couldn't walk and he had to be admitted to the hospital and in the hospital we found that his ferritin was 13000 his triglycerides were elevated his soluble il2 was i don't know 15000 So basically he met all the criteria for HLH and he was diagnosed with HLH. We got an urgent biopsy of the cervical lymph node and it showed classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So the patient like within one week of being admitted he was given ABVD. 2 days later gone. Fever's better. 3 days later he was discharged. And the patient has probably received two three chemo since then, but now that he's totally asymptomatic, he stopped coming, which we've been calling him to try and come back. But uh, you know, he's just become a little non-adherent. So this is his PET scan um, at diagnosis. So you can see basically this is a this is a processed image. So I showed you the PET scan before, which was kind of a raw image. That's how the scans actually come out as. and now we have these fancy computers which can process the pet scans and make them look pretty so there is a scale here on the left side where you know the more white something is the more active that thing is it's taking up more sugar so and it's cancer so you can see uh, this patient definitely has left cervical lymph nodes over here and then um this other one basically you can see the spleen light up so this patient has stage 3 disease because he has um involvement both above and below the diaphragm so he has advanced stage hodgkin lymphoma so again abvd to the rescue so the most common treatment is abvd six cycles boom done um there is another regimen which you might see thrown around is called biocop which is basically abvd on steroids um it's just addition of more drugs more intense and people in europe use it a lot because biocop definitely works better by about 5 to 10% but the problem again is it has higher toxicity and it has higher risk of secondary malignancies and infertility so depending on who you ask if you ask an european ask a european oncologist they would use biocop in a patient like this versus in america we would start with abvd so how do we balance efficacy and long term toxicity um so now people are like okay we need to find a consensus so again pet scan to the rescue and basically all these graphs are showing exactly the same thing is that if your pet is negative in between or at the end you're going to do good no matter what recipe you use 
if your pet is positive when you are getting your treatment, usually after two cycles is when we do the pet, no matter what recipe you use, it's not going to be as good. So what people did was they, they came up with a trial, of course, to study hypothesis. And what they did was that, I'm not going to go through the whole regimen, it's kind of complicated, but what they did was is that, I'm going to go back one second, look at this, this arm on the right side. Basically, if your pet is negative, you're going to do good no matter what. So they, they dropped bleomycin. So they decided that, okay, we are going to give ABVD or we're going to give AVD and let's see what happens. And, and what they found is that you don't need bleomycin anymore. So if you drop bleomycin after two cycles, if your pet is negative, you're good. And that was important because, you know, remember bleomycin, it can cause lung toxicity. And once lung toxicity, like I've seen people die of lung toxicity. So it's a kind of like a wild card drug where you can't really predict the lung toxicity. So that was a major advance in the field. And it's become a standard of care is what we call the rattle or pet adaptive approach that you just drop bleomycin after two cycles. So that was one advance that reduced toxicity. But of course, remember I said that since 1973, we've been kind of fudging around with ABVD chemotherapy. Come on, like this is 20, 20 sorry, 21. We need to do something better. We have so much knowledge about the biology of Hodgkin lymphoma. Can we do anything? So. 2011 was when there was a breakthrough where brentuximab was approved, which is an anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody. And then now is the era of immunotherapy. So nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are both anti-PD-1 uh, monoclonal antibodies are the most recent uh, approvals for Hodgkin lymphoma. And that are really changing the field uh, right now. So what is brentuximab vidotin? It's an antibody drug conjugate, and this is super cool. This is like cutting edge, is you know, we, they are monoclonal antibodies. They're using the monoclonal antibody as a vehicle to bind chemotherapy to it. So they are like attaching a little bit of chemotherapy. And then the, the monoclonal antibody kind of goes around your whole body. It targets, it finds those cancer cells which express CD30. And then it's internalized and then it releases its chemo inside the cancer cell. So rather than you getting chemo, which is affecting the whole body and causing side effects, your chemo is being delivered, tar it's targeted to the cancer cells themselves. So this is brentuximab. And now there was this trial called the Echelon 1, which has brought brentuximab to frontline. So remember we had the ABVD. So now we have this regimen called AAVD, which is another option that we can use in high-risk patients. Let's talk about immune checkpoints. So immune checkpoints, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, how they work is, remember I was talking about PDL1, which is how it's the smoke screen that the cancer cell releases to kind of paralyze all the immune cells around it. So nivolumab, it intercepts that. So instead of the PDL1 binding with PD1, it PD-1 gets busy binding to nivolumab or pembrolizumab. It activates the immune system again. It activates the T cells and the T cells can now recognize these cancer cells and they go after it and they kill it. Um, that's how these two drugs work. And nivolumab was really a classic example of bench to bedside where this was the first study of nivolumab reported in Hodgkin lymphoma. And this plot is what we call a waterfall plot. Of course, it looks like a waterfall. And this basically shows that all the patients who got the drug responded nicely and the extent of response. So this was amazing. And based on that, now there are a lot of clinical trials. This was in relapse setting. So now there are a lot of clinical trials which are ongoing in the first line setting based on this data. Let's talk about briefly about therapy in the second line setting. So I think we're a little short on time. So I'm going to go over this case quickly. So, um, I mean, you can look at this PET scan, you can tell this is bad disease, right? So this was a patient who, who actually presented with respiratory failure. And then she got BACOB, which was that stronger chemo we talked about. But then her disease progressed, it came back within one year. So she got this chemotherapy called ICE, which is even stronger, didn't work. We gave her brentuximab, which is the approval, the anti-CD30 we talked about, complete response. So then our plan was to do a transplant, which is the standard of care, is that once a patient relapses, 
uh, the disease relapses, you don't just give chemo and put them in remission again, you give chemo and you do a transplant. But this patient, she had psychiatric issues, she was lost to follow up. So, so far we have followed all standard of care, you know, we gave all these chemo regimens. And then why we wanted to do a transplant is because of this data where if you do a transplant, the outcomes are better. But then I'm going to skip this slide for uh, interest of time. So what happened was that this patient, she did have a nice response to brintuximab, but then she was lost to follow up. So not surprisingly, she came back. And this time, again, her disease had progressed. And look at her scan. I mean, pretty florid progression. In fact, she was in the ICU again. So we tried the brintuximab again. It didn't work. So then we gave her pembrolizumab got her out of the ICU, she got discharged, and we kept giving pembrolizumab every three weeks. And this is her scan six months later, complete remission. So this stuff works, it's very powerful. Um, and again, so now the patient was feeling so good and she had other issues. She was admitted to the psych unit that she hasn't come in uh, about eight months, but we do get phone calls from her family and she's still in remission. So very gratifying to have these options for patients who would have died five years ago because there were no other options. So, so what is the current treatment paradigm for classical Hodgkin lymphoma? Um, in the frontline setting, like we discussed, ABVD is your go-to. In the salvage setting means after the first relapse, um, you do chemotherapy and you try a transplant, but if not, there are a lot of new clinical trials ongoing. And um, if the patient has relapsed, disease that has relapsed further, then you can try Pembro, Nevo, Brentaximab and such. What's cooking? What's on the horizon? You know, the story just gets crazier and crazier. It's almost like science fiction. So there is something called camidanul camidanulumab, which is another antibody drug conjugate against CD25, which is also something that's expressed on reed Sternberg cells. And then there is the CAR T cell therapy, which is basically that you program your, the patient's own T cells, um, attach what we call a chimeric antigen receptor, and then you give it back to the patient. The cells kind of go in like heat seeking missiles. They kind of uh, seek the cancer and then they uh, destroy the cancer cells. So still very early data and available only as clinical trials, but this is something that you might see come by in the next five to 10 years. One slide about unmet needs, you know, all this looks amazing. I talked about cure rates of 80 to 90%, but this is not the reality in patients who are above the age of 60. Um, above the age of 60, the outcomes, the, the remission rates and the long-term survival rates are actually around 50 to 60%. So it's really important that we focus our research on these patients who really need um, more tolerable options. And lastly, we want to talk about survivorship uh, because of all the reasons I mentioned before. So these are the NCCN guidelines for how these patients should be monitored. Basically, they need to have risk screening for heart disease. They need to have breast cancer screening, lung cancer screening. And if they had splenic irradiation, they need to get all their vaccines. Um, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, very rare very different. It's treated more as a B-cell lymphoma, even though historically it's still called a Hodgkin lymphoma. It's really different. Um, so the biggest, uh, I would say, thing to remember is not to confuse it with classical Hodgkin lymphoma and treat, treat it aggressively. You really need a good pathologist to tell you the difference. So lots that we covered today. I'm going to finish with my take-home points. Hodgkin lymphoma is the poster child of success of multi-agent chemotherapy regimens. Reed Sternberg cell is the hallmark of diagnosis. Surgical biopsy is preferred for diagnosis, and this point is the one that non-medicine, non-oncologists need to remember. Um, classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma are two distinct diseases. Hodgkin lymphoma has an excellent prognosis, so we really need to balance cure versus late side effects. Risk stratification based on scoring systems and interim PET scan is the foundation for therapeutic decisions. 
And novel agents such as brentuximab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab have really improved outcomes for relapse disease. Um, and studies are ongoing to bring these drugs into earlier lines of therapy. Um, I don't know if you guys know what is Kheer or rice pudding. So I would like to say that Hodgkin lymphoma is like Kheer because no matter what recipe you use, the outcome is likely to be excellent. Um, thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to answer all the questions in the chat or if anybody wants to ask anything. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, there are some questions in the chat here. Um, I can just read them to you if that works. Uh, the first one is about recurrence in post-treatment in younger patients. Yeah, so I guess the question is about the first relapse is, are, are you asking for recurrence rate? So um, depending on the uh, stage of the disease, you know, uh, the risk of recurrence is about 10 to 20% for early stage disease and about 25% for uh, 25 to 30% for advanced stage. Um, and then um, in terms of outcomes, it really depends on how old the patient is and whether they can tolerate um, aggressive chemotherapy and a transplant. So like I mentioned in um, younger patients, first, first re a relapse is not really, I mean, of course it's bad, but you know, you can still save a lot of these patients by auto transplant. And now we have nivolumab and pembrolizumab like in our patient. But in older folks, uh, it's a challenge because they're not able to tolerate these aggressive treatments. So then, you know, in Hodgkin lymphoma, we always try to cure, cure, cure. But in older adults, sometimes we have to switch our goal from cure to palliation where we keep them on pembrolizumab single agent or nivolumab. But sometimes it does lead to a cure. So but we, you know, I mean, we tell them that, listen, we're not sure, but it, it will control your disease. And then next we have the average age to treat with cyclophosphamide. Yeah, so in the first line therapy where we use ABVD, there is no cyclophosphamide. Having said that, these treatments are pretty aggressive. So I give it to even people about the age of 80, uh, we used to even push the uh, push the envelope and give it to above people above 82 and just reduce the doses a little bit. But now that we have other agents, you know, there's a combination of chemo-free combination, brentuximab and nivolumab, which is being studied in frontline. So hopefully these treatments will be better tolerated for older adults. Cyclophosphamide is used in treatment uh, during transplant, uh, but you know, like there are many other things that are, so the average cutoff for somebody to get a transplant is about 75 years. And that's very dependent on country to country. Like I know in India, 65 is kind of their limit. In Europe also 70 is kind of their limit. So it just depends on which country you're in. And finally, the one for now is a PET scan and diagnosis and follow-up. Yeah, so that's also a very good question. Um, and I should have specified it better. You, the standard of care is to absolutely get a PET scan and diagnosis after two cycles, which is what we call the IPET or the interim PET scan, and then at the end of treatment. So these are the three time points that we need PET scans. For follow-up, people used to order a lot of PET scans and CT scans. But, you know, again, these people are young. So how many years are you going to do scans? That's a lot of radiation. And also this lymphoma doesn't sit quietly. I mean, it's going to wreck. If you do a scan today, it doesn't mean that the lymphoma, and then you do a scan in six months, the lymphoma is not going to wait for six months. So patients will call you. So now we do scans for the first two years, like every six months or so, but then we just monitor clinically. And even that, I know many people don't do that. And we don't do a PET scan usually, we just do a CT scan. Uh, but most people that I've diagnosed with the recurrence have actually called and said, hey, I noticed something growing rather than picking it up asymptomatically on a scan. Okay, perfect. Yes, that looks like those are all the questions. Are there any other questions? Uh, you can put in the chat um, if you have any more. And if not, a recording of this will be placed on the website, so then you can rewatch it as many times whenever you'd like as well.
Okay, looks like there are no more questions. So thank you so much. We really, really appreciate having you here. We have viewers from all over the world who's gonna really benefit from this presentation. So thank you for your time. Thanks for arranging everything nicely. Okay, we'll see you all in the next one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.